Day, and welcome to the Bristol Myers Squibb 2020 Fourth Quarter Results Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Tim Power, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thanks, Lauren, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our fourth quarter 2020 earnings call. Joining me this morning with prepared remarks, as usual, are Giovanni Caforio, our board chair and chief, chief executive officer, and David Elkins, our chief financial officer. And also taking part in today's call are Chris Berner, our chief commercialization officer, and Simon Hirawat, our chief medical officer and head of global drug development. Uh, you'll note that we've posted slides to BMS.com that you can use to follow along with for, for Giovanni and David's remarks. But before we get started, let me read our forward-looking statements. During today's call, we'll make statements about the company's future plans and prospects to constitute forward-looking statements. Actual results may differ materially from those indicated by these forward-looking statements as a result of various important factors, including uh, those discussed in the company's SEC findings. These forward-looking statements represent our estimates as of today and should not be relied upon as representing our estimates as of any future date. We specifically disclaim any obligation to update forward-looking statements even if our estimates change. We'll also focus our comments on our non-GAAP financial measures, which are adjusted to exclude certain specified items. Reconciliations of those non-GAAP financial measures, the most comparable GAAP measures, are available at BMS.com. And with that, let me hand over to Giovanni. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. I hope you're all uh, staying safe and healthy. I want to open by saying I'm really proud of what we accomplished in 2020. Our teams executed well commercially, advanced our pipeline, kept our integration efforts ahead of schedule, and executed important business development activities. We did this while managing through the complexities of the pandemic, keeping our teams safe, and our patients at the center of everything we do. Turning to slide four, in Q4, we delivered another strong quarter. Commercial performance was strong, with sales increasing 10%, compared to performa sales for the same period in the prior year. And we made significant progress to advance our pipeline. Of note, we continue to make progress with our launches, including good momentum for Obdivo Plus Yervo in first line lung, which supports our confidence in a return to growth of Obdivo this year. Reblozil, which has seen a strong launch with rapid adoption in MDS. Symposia, which is well positioned as the S1P modulator of choice in multiple sclerosis, and Onureg, which is the only oral option with an overall survival benefit in first-line AML response maintenance. We closed the acquisition of myocardia, bringing us Mavacampton and strengthening our existing presence in cardiovascular. During the quarter, we also continued to advance our pipeline including regulatory filings and approvals in our I.O., immunology, and hematology portfolio. Most recently, with positive top-line results for Ducravacitinib in psoriasis. We demonstrated strong financial results, enabling an increased non-GAAP earnings per share outlook for 2021. As you will have just seen, we have entered into a licensing arrangement with the Rockefeller University for the development of a dual antibody combination for the treatment of COVID-19. Though early, we believe this treatment could be differentiated with the potential for low-dose subcutaneous administration. We are pleased to partner with Rockefeller University and leverage our expertise in antibody technology and strength in development, manufacturing, and distribution to bring this potential option to patients. Moving to slide five, let me put the performance from the quarter and full year 2020 into context. Thanks to excellent execution throughout the year, we have continued to deliver on all value drivers of the cell gene acquisition and laid a strong foundation for future growth of our new company. We are well positioned to accelerate the renewal of our portfolio and support the long-term growth of our business. Last month at JP Morgan, I shared why I have confidence in the future of Bristol Myers Squibb. The integration of Celgene has gone very well. Based on progress last year, we now expect total synergies to be close to 3 billion 
by the end of 22. We have proven commercial capabilities, which enable us to fully realize the opportunities to grow our inline portfolio and support strong execution of our launches. The breadth and depth of our late stage pipeline is reflected in the significant number of milestones delivered last year. Finally, our financial strength makes it possible for us to continue to invest in future growth internally and externally through business development. Now turning to slide six. Overall, we are in a strong position to unlock the potential of the company we planned to build when we acquired Celgen. We're building a company with a younger, more diversified portfolio of medicines, better positioned in the second half of the decade. Let me remind you where we believe we are heading. We are confident we can more than offset the impact of near-term tariff expiries, including a limit. We expect to grow our revenue and earnings through 2025, with low to mid-single-digit revenue figure for 2025 driven by the significant growth potential of our continuing business, which is comprised of our inline growth drivers and our launch brands. We see strong momentum for this portfolio, which excludes Red Limit and Pomalist, with low double-digit revenue CAGR during the same period. Looking out to 2025, we expect the continuing business will represent approximately 90% of the company with 30% of that revenue from our newly launched products. Importantly, looking out to the second half of the decade on slide seven, we have multiple sources of portfolio renewal. Our recently launched products will continue to grow. Most have significant expansion opportunities beyond the launch indication. We have a rich mid to late stage pipeline with assets such as our factor 11A inhibitor and our multiple myeloma cell bonds, hibridamide and CC92480. We will continue to advance our diverse early R&D portfolio and further invest in business development opportunities, just as we have done with myocardia. We believe we can achieve this while maintaining very strong profitability with operating margins expected in the low to mid 40s. Turning to our execution scorecard on slide eight, at JP Morgan, I outlined several important milestones that would support our success. And as mentioned, we've already delivered on a number of those. Obdivo plus Cabo was recently approved by the FDA for patients with first line RCC. This week, we delivered the second positive phase three for Ducravacitinib in plaque psoriasis supporting the filing of this potential new therapy to help authorities in the near term. Ziposia was filed for the treatment of ulcerative colitis in the U.S., and we look forward to launching that indication later this year. Moving to slide nine, as we think about this year, based on the strength of our business and the exciting opportunities ahead, we are increasing our non-GAAP earnings per share guidance for 21. David will provide more details on the financials, but let me offer some perspective on key areas of focus in 21. Commercially, we expect a revenue growth across key businesses, driven in large part by the continued execution of our recent launches, of Vivo's return to growth, and Eliquis. We will continue to advance our pipeline and have important milestones ahead this year such as filing Maracampton, phase two data for factor 11A, proof of concept data for Ducravacidinib in ulcerative colitis, and initial data for iberdamide in refractory multiple myeloma. We will maintain a balanced approach to capital allocation. Disciplined business development is a top priority and provides an opportunity to further invest in future growth. David will provide more color on our consistent approach to capital allocation in a few minutes. This year, we also anticipate the U.S. policy environment will continue to evolve, and I'm confident the diversification of our portfolio will help us navigate potential changes. We agree 
the patient affordability needs to be improved, and we are supportive of policies that can address this issue. We look forward to working with the new administration and congressional leaders to foster an environment that supports innovation and enhances patient access to medicines. To close, I am encouraged by the strength and momentum across the company. Across our four key therapeutic areas of hematology, oncology, cardiovascular, and immunology, we have leading inline medicines, significant short-term launch opportunities, and the rich pipeline. Our diversified portfolio and leading position in each business allows us to be less dependent on any one product or business. I'm also immensely proud of our employees. Their talent is second to none, and their commitment is inspiring. I feel very good about the future of Bristol-Myers Squibb and the potential that lies before us. I will now hand it over to David to walk you through the financials. David? Thank you, Giovanni, and hello, everyone, and thanks again for joining our call today. Um, if you turn to slide 11, I'd like to discuss our robust pipeline, top line performance for the quarter. Our teams continue to operate well in a virtual environment, delivering very strong quarterly and full year results. For the fourth quarter, revenues grew 10% on a performance basis versus prior year, reflecting strong execution across the world. During the quarter, we also saw approximately $250 million of favorable inventory bills versus the third quarter, primarily driven by Eliquis and Revlimid as well as a 2% favorable impact from foreign exchange. Full year revenues were equally strong and reflect the performer growth of 7%. I'll now provide additional color on the performance of our key brands and new launches. Now, starting with Eloquist on slide 12, global sales continue to perform very well, growing double digit for both the fourth quarter and the full year. In the US, fourth quarter sales increased 6% versus prior year, driven by robust 17% TRX growth, and an inventory bill partially offset by expected higher gross to net impact from the coverage gap. Inventory bill versus prior quarter was approximately $100 million. So we saw total new scripts for oral anticoagulant declining during last year due to COVID. We are starting to see naive volumes return to pre-COVID levels. Internationally, sales remain strong with revenue of approximately $1 billion growing 19% versus prior year. Eloquist continues to be the number one NOAC in multiple key markets internationally, including Germany, France, and the UK. Both in the US and internationally, we believe that the growth outlook for Eloquist remains strong as we continue to grow the oral anticoagulant class, as well as increasing our share within the class. Turning to slide 13, Global sales of Optiva grew 2% in the fourth quarter versus prior year, primarily driven by strong growth in international markets. In the U.S., the teams continue to execute well, largely through remote engagement. During the fourth quarter, we saw an expected unwind of favorable inventory we discussed last quarter. Importantly, our first-line lung cancer continues to go very well, with our share now in the low double-digit range. This is visible by the strong 20% sales growth of year avoiding the quarter versus prior year. We continue to work through the pressure of our second line indication, which is stabilizing, and now starting to be balanced out by the momentum we are building in first line lung. We remain very confident in the return to growth for Optivo in the U.S. this year. We expect continued growth in first line lung, combined with launches and additional indications, including first-line renal with the recent approval of Devo plus Cabo and the opportunity to be the first IO agent in first-line gastric, as well as several new adjuvant launches. Internationally, we continue to see strong commercial execution with growth primarily driven by first-line melanoma and RCC as we continue to secure reimbursement around the world. We are pleased with the recent Japanese approvals and the launch in first-line lung with a broad label in all comers as well as the EU approval of 9LA, and we'll be working on securing reimbursements in various countries throughout 2021. Now moving to our <clears throat> inline multiple myeloma portfolio on slide 14. Revlimid and Pomlos continue to perform very well with strong double digit quarterly growth on a performer basis. Globally, Revlimid grew 18%, primarily driven by continued increase in treatment duration. 
and U.S. fourth quarter revenues increased 15 percent, primarily driven by solid demand and inventory build compared to prior year. The inventory build versus prior quarter was approximately $100 million, and we expect this inventory build to reverse in the first quarter. Outside the U.S., revenues were strong, with growth of 24% in the fourth quarter versus prior year, due to the growth in the triplet combinations, which include new reimbursement for RVD in several countries. We should note that this strong revenue growth included an earlier-than-expected tender of approximately $80 million. Pomelo's global performer revenues continue to reflect significant growth, up 21%. In the U.S., performer revenues increased 18% and internationally up 27%, driven by increased usage in earlier lines and longer treatment durations. As we look to the first quarter of 2021, our image portfolio, in addition to the inventory bill in the U.S., I would like to remind you of a typical seasonality of Revlimid and Pomelo's experience due to patients entering the Medicare coverage gap earlier in the year. Now, moving on to our recent launches on 515, our new launches contributed just over $300 million in 2020. Rebozel is off to a great start with global revenues in the year of $274 million. In the U.S., we experienced significant pent-up demand from the MDS launch in Q2 and Q3. And during the fourth quarter, we began to see expected evolution from the original bolus to true underlying demand. We continue to expect growth through new patient starts early in their treatment journey. Internationally, initial launches in Germany and Austria are going very well. We continue our launches in various markets globally over the course of 2021 as we receive reimbursement. Now turning to Symposia, strong commercial access has been secured with greater than 90% of U.S. commercial lives covered. We remain focused on driving demand and establishing Symposia as the leading S1P modulator in multiple sclerosis. Outside the U.S., we have now launched in Germany, Switzerland, Canada, the Netherlands, and Norway, and will continue to secure reimbursement in other markets throughout the year. In addition to our MS launch, we now have a Paducah date for Symposia in UC in May and look forward to building momentum of this differentiated medicine. An MAA has been validated in Europe, and we will work with European health authorities to bring this medicine to patients as soon as possible. Moving on to Anureg, initial feedback from physicians has been very positive in establishing Anureg as the first and only oral treatment to demonstrate an overall survival benefit for first-line AML maintenance patients. With the data now published in the New England Journal of Medicine, we are focusing on educating physicians on this new maintenance therapy for patients. The MAA remains under review in the EU with approval expected this year. Now, moving to our balance sheet and capital allocation on slide 16, you'll see we continue to generate a significant amount of cash flow from operations of approximately $3.4 billion in the fourth quarter. We ended the quarter in a strong liquidity position with approximately $16 billion in cash and marketable securities. Our capital allocation priorities are unchanged. Business development remains top priority. We are committed to reducing our debt and returning capital to shareholders. With respect to business development, we plan to focus on strengthening our pipeline on mid-size, bolt-on deals that further strengthen the company into the second half of the decade. We will remain disciplined with respect to deals that we execute and consistent with our criteria of being strategically aligned, scientifically sound, and financially attractive. As it relates to reducing debt, we will continue to be focused on this, further strengthening our ability to invest for growth. This morning, we announced a debt reduction transaction of up to $4 billion. Based upon the bonds we are targeting, we still expect to see our leverage ratio reduced by one and a half times debt to EBITDA in 24. Importantly, we are committed to a strong investment grade credit, credit rating, which is apparent through our willingness to use excess cash to proactively accelerate debt reduction. Lastly, we're committed to returning capital shareholders through continued dividend growth and share repurchases. We have increased our dividend for the 12th consecutive year and recently increased our share repurchase authorization with plans to execute a total of three to four billion in share repurchases by the end of this year. Now let's turn to our guidance for 2021 on slide 17. Let me start by giving a quick update on our synergies. As Giovanni mentioned, the integration has gone very well, 
and we increased our total expected synergies to approximately $3 billion by the end of 22. We achieved about $1.4 billion in 2020 and expect the remaining synergy capture to be split evenly uh, through this year and in 22. With that in mind, and considering the momentum we saw in the business in 2020, we've increased our non-GAAP diluted EPS guidance for 2021. Now, touching on our non-GAAP expectation at constant exchange rates, we expect high single-digit revenue growth over 2020 based on the strength of our inline product and the launches we are executing. We expect to sustain a high enterprise gross margin of approximately 80.5%. Now, I want to take a moment to touch on MSNA. In 2020, we had the opportunity to make a number of incremental and accelerated investments to support our prioritized brands and product launches. Also, with COVID recovery and higher expenses due to myocardia are reflected. For 2021, we expect MFNA to increase in the low single digit as we invest in our launches and include the full year spend for myocardia. We expect mid single digit increase in R&D as we invest behind a robust pipeline, COVID recovery plans in preclinical and clinical studies and incorporate spend of myocardia. We expect our tax rate to remain about 16%. And finally, based on the strength and the momentum in the business, we are now increasing our non-GAAP 2021 diluted EPS to $7.35 to $7.55. I would also like to provide some color on OINE and share count. It's likely we'll see realty income and net interest expense to roughly offset each other in 2021, resulting in net neutral OINE. Regarding our share count, we ended 2020 with approximately $2.3 billion, $2.3 billion shares outstanding, which will decrease based upon the three to four billion repurchase activity we're planning in the year. Now, before we move on to the Q&A session, I wanna thank our teams around the world for delivering such outstanding results in 2020. These results demonstrate a resiliency of our portfolio and position us well for strong growth in 2021 and into the future. I'll now turn the call back over to Tim and Giovanni for Q&A. Thanks very much, David. Lauren, can we go for a first question, please? Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, that is star one to ask a question. Our first question comes from Jeff Meacham with Bank of America. Morning, guys. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, just have two quick ones. Um, for Chris, when you look at the new launches on slide 15, obviously these are a big part of the LOE offset over time. So the question is, what do you see as a tipping point in demand for these three products? And how should we think about initial adoption for Lysacel and Idacel later this year? And then development question for, for Duke Ravacitinib. Just wanted to get your thoughts on safety tolerability. Not having a black box will obviously be a big commercial driver, but it's possible that recent safety data for Zelgent and a somewhat related mechanism could indirectly impact you guys. I want to get your thoughts on that. Thank you. Sure. Let me um, let me start with the question on the um, tipping point, and then also your question with respect to Lysacel. And maybe I'll start with the question on uh, Lysacel and how we're thinking about the launch there. We're obviously very excited about the opportunity to launch uh, Lysacel in DOBCL. We expect that imminently. Um, we are obviously going to be very much focused on. Uh, ensuring at launch the that sites are um, activated very quickly, that we're able to get patients efficiently moved on to therapy. And then, as we've stated repeatedly, uh, really the tipping point with respect to Briandi is going to be um, our ability to continue to expand the CAR-T market by driving referrals and expanding the site put footprint, and then ultimately being able to leverage what we believe to be a differentiated um, product profile in order to drive brand share. And so that's going to be very important. And a similar story will be for, for IDASL, where obviously we have a very strong position in, um, in multiple myeloma to leverage. With respect to um, staying in hematology uh, of, of the three products that were on the slide, Reblazil, 
Um, obviously, Revlozil is off to a very good start. We're very pleased with the launch so far. The execution for this product has gone very well, and we continue to believe that Revlozil is going to play in a very important role in both MDS and beta thalassemia. Um, as we look at um, where the where the launch is at this point, we think thus far we've had very good um, demand. Some of that demand, frankly, has been pent up. Um, and as we get into the first quarter and certainly into this year, we think we'll be tapping into the true underlying demand. But we continue to see real opportunity to grow this brand, both in its labeled indication, um, as well as potentially to expand into the first line ESA naive with the command studies and ultimately potentially uh, into MF. Um, and then for Onureg, Onureg is obviously off to a very good start, as David mentioned. There remains a very high unmet need for patients in first-line AML who've achieved a CR post-intensive chemo but aren't candidates for stem cell. Um, we believe that um, really the opportunity here is going to be to continue to drive the benefit that we see from an overall survival standpoint with Onureg. But importantly, this is a market where there is no established uh, treatment approach in AML maintenance. So um, what we're going to have to do is continue to build that market and convince physicians that um, it's um, a, a new paradigm to um, treat these patients and that there's a real urgency to treat. And then finally, to pick up on the question on Zaposia, we are very pleased with what we have um, seen with the opportunity for Zaposia, not only in MS, but particularly in IBD. Uh, the MS launch, we think, is, is going well in spite of um, the situation with COVID. We've seen good uptake from uh, physicians in terms of willingness to prescribe. Importantly, um, the percentage of physicians who now believe that Zaposia is the best S1P is very much on track with what we had hoped for. And given the data that we saw with True North, we think there's considerable opportunity for us to drive business there as well. So very excited about the opportunity with Zaposia. Maybe I'll turn it over to, um, to Summit. Thanks, uh, uh, Chris, and thanks, Jeff, for the question. Abicovacitinib, let me just start first by saying that for, the, for our tip two inhibitor, Abicovacitinib, this is not a JAK inhibitor. And the reason I say that is because of the specificity and selectivity in terms of targeting tick 2 downstream inhibition of IL-12, IL-23, and interferon alpha, which leads to a profile that is differentiated. We do not see the signals of uh, lab abnormalities that are generally associated with JAK inhibitors. We do not see the signals uh, for VTEs that are generally associated with uh, JAK inhibitors. What we have are two very well-conducted phase three trials showing remarkable efficacy. We are very pleased with the data that we've seen, meaning the primary and secondary endpoints. And we are now looking forward to the data evolving, as Giovanni mentioned on one of the slides, in, in the next generation of, of trials that are ongoing in IBD, SLE, and beyond. So we are looking forward to the readout of those trials and very pleased where we're staying. Thanks so much. Uh, Lauren, can we go to the next question, please? Our next question comes from Terrence Flynn with Goldman Sachs. Great. Uh, thanks for taking the, the question. Um, I just, uh, maybe two parts. Um, first, on Opdivo, Chris, was just wondering if you can help us think about the cadence of contribution from some of the new approvals, so Checkmate 9ER, and then maybe on the, the adjuvant side, when we could start um, seeing um, some, some pull through there. Is this more the growth going to be weighted to the second half of the year? And then on Factor 11A Summit, um, maybe you could just opine here on, on kind of what you're hoping to see um, on the profile from the initial phase two trial uh, later this year. Thank you. Let me start, Terrence, and then I'll turn it over to Summit. So, yeah, so we're, we're excited for the outlook for Opdivo. Um, as was mentioned earlier in the call, we do see um, continued confidence that Opdivo is going to return to growth in 2021 and contribute meaningfully uh, as part of the I.O. franchise to company growth beyond that. What I would say to answer your question on 9ER is, first of all, 9ER needs to be put within the context of, first of all, a very um, stable business that we're starting to see in the U.S., a strong business, as you saw in the, in the numbers uh, in, in Q4 XUS. And then, as David mentioned, we've seen good uptake in the first line lung launch uh, in the U.S., and it's still very early days outside of the U.S., 
Uh, we do see that there um, is uh, a nice opportunity with 9ER and first-line renal. Again, as we talked about, uh, we've got.